Excellent. All right. So hopefully that was enough time and I got the warm up. I saw Fraylin helping Gloria. I appreciate that, Fraylin. Uh, if you guys need any help, you're welcome to help each other like that. That's the kind of mentality. And I think teamwork that's going to get us where we need to be. So proud of you for that, Fraylin. And proud of you, Gloria, for asking for help. What's up, Shade? Yeah, I, yeah, clearly. So just after school today, do you know who Mr. Dickerson is? Okay. Um, just go to the media center after school if you can. We have time. And if not, if Thursday when you come back, um, just go to the media center before. You know where the media center is, right? Okay. He'll, he'll give you a new one. I don't think you have to pay for it. <clears throat> All right, so today is April 13th, 2021. And it's the second day of our eighth unit. We're gonna talk about natural selection today. This is one of the most foundational concepts when we think about evolution. So if we can understand natural selection, we'll be in a much better position going into our discussion Thursday when we'll actually talk about evolution. So the objective today is to explain how natural selection influences the changes in species over time. Over time, that's super, super important. I'm gonna keep emphasizing that. This is not something that happens um, between one day or one week or a year. Uh, we're talking about long periods of time, okay? First, I wanna talk about the warm up though. And I saw most of you did look like you did do the warm up, so that's, that's good. The first part of the warm up, the first question just asks you to place the levels of classification in the correct order. And this was something we talked about yesterday. Um, so we want to th we want to go from most general to most specific. That's what MG and MS stand for. So what's the most general um, level domain? Good. And then what comes after that? Good kingdom. What about after that? Phylum. Good. Class, good. Order. Three more. Family, good. Genus, and then species. Excellent. If you didn't get this right uh, in the warm up, or if you weren't able to follow along just now as we were talking about it, definitely recommend that you write it down. Um, the easy mnemonic device that we introduced yesterday is do keep pond clean or family gets sick. Uh, if you can come up with your own mnemonic device, I will happily give you extra credit, even if it's in another language. I think that'd be cool if we can get some, some mnemonic device in another language. So a mnemonic device is basically just a sentence or an acronym that helps you to remember uh, a specific order of, of things. So in this case, if you can come up with your own for DKPCOFGS, I'll give you extra credit. It'll go towards your unit seven tests. Okay. And then the second part asks us to look at this dichotomous key. The question asks, what is the scientific name of the species that has a purple colored body, does not have a pointy hump, and does have ears? So what do we, where, where do we start when we're looking at these dichotomous keys? Would you say? Yeah, we're just gonna stop at, start at the, at the top of the chart. I'm sorry, thank you, Shade. So we're just looking at those first two statements. Um, does it have a green body or does it have a purple body? It has purple. So what do we do with that information? Once we know that it has a, Good, so we look at that, that's the correct statement. It has a purple colored body. It tells us to go to the fourth statements, the fourth set of statements. The fourth set of statements says, has a pointy hump or does not have a pointy hump. So what do we know about this, this species? 
it does not have a pointy hump. So what do we do with that information? We go to five, good. And then the fifth set of statements right there says has ears or does not have ears. What, do, what are we given? Yeah, it does have ears, right? So now this is just a made up species. This isn't this is not real, obviously. We don't have any purple colored deer, but um, this is how these dichotomous keys work. So you're just gonna jump from one statement to the next until you actually end up finding the correct scientific name, which in this case is Deerus perplenus. All right, now I didn't want to include, there were, I think three, I, I put three questions about this phylogenetic tree um, in your warm up. So I didn't want to include all three, but I just wanted to kind of take a look at this and make sure that you all are understanding how to read these phylogenetic trees. So yesterday we talked about the fact that the closer two species are, the more closely related they are. That's, uh, I don't want to confuse you about that, but that can be a little misleading. Um, because if we look at this phylogenetic tree, we see that alligator and robin are obviously pretty close together, but they're no closer together than um, frog and lizard, right? So we'll get more practice with those phylogenetic trees. Um, it's not going to come up all that much on the EOC. Maybe there will be one question about it. So um, we don't need to focus too heavily on it. What we're going to talk about today is important, though. Natural selection is one of the most important concepts in the class. Um, and it, it's going to help us understand evolution better. And then evolution is going to lead into some other important conversations that we'll have in the last month of school. But this idea of natural selection really starts with a, a conversation about descent with modification. Descent with modification. Does anybody know which continent this is? Good, that's Africa. Um, now I'll be super impressed if you can tell me what country that is down there. <laughs> Okay, I, I, couldn't, I wouldn't have known that in high school either. That is Namibia, um, and that's why it's called the Namib Desert. So the Namib Desert is obviously a place where uh, there's very little rain. Now, if you notice, Africa is pretty distinct. It's got the Saharan Desert, which is kind of the Now, the Demid Desert has these huge sand dunes, which are um, very, very tall hills of sand. And on these sand dunes, you might find this bug. Hard, it's hard for you guys to, to see. That's probably a little better. All right, so uh, this is an interesting bug. I'm not going to try to pronounce its scientific name, but there's the scientific name right there. Um, what would this word be? No. 
So that O word, ona, let's let's call it onomacris. That's the genus of of this species, and then uh, unguicularis. We'll say unguicularis. That is the actual species name. Um, notice how it's written as well. It's italicized. The genus is capitalized, and the species is lowercase. So you're going to see a lot of that in today's lesson. But this specific bug bug is really interesting. So of course, in the desert, it doesn't rain, right? but it does get really foggy. And that fog uh, is basically the only source of water in this desert environment. So this bug is going to climb up the top of the dune and kind of position itself in the midst of this fog. Um, and what it does next is pretty interesting. So there's not much water in the desert. The bug climbs to the dune and it's actually gonna tilt its head downward and droplets of water will start to collect on its underbelly. And as it kind of tilts its head downward, the water is going to actually fall into its mouth. And this is how the bug gets water. Um, there is no other source. It's not like it's going to find a pond or anything like that. It has to actually collect water from the fog. So this is genius, right? This is almost hard for us to imagine that the bug would know how to do something like this. So. This, this, this bug is just like really any other beetle. It's not alone, there are plenty of beetles. In fact, beetles are one of the most known species um, or families, family of species in the world. There are over 350,000 uh, known beetles and they represent about 20% of the known species living on land. So that's, that's a huge amount. They are extremely diverse, but they also have some shared characteristics. All beetles have three pairs of legs. All beetles have a hard exoskeleton, so like a hard shell covering. And they all have two pairs of wings. So even though we see even in this image that they all look totally differently, they live in different environments, they have different capabilities, they do have those shared similarities. And this leads us to three very important characteristics. Oh, I guess I'll tell you after we watch this quick video. Hold on. Before we solve a problem, we should ask, has it been solved anywhere in the natural world? Life has ingenious ways of meeting its needs. In the Namib Desert, there's very little groundwater, but there is a fog that comes in a few times a week. And there's a tiny black beetle that climbs up to the top of a dune, stands on his head, lifts his wing scales up into that flow. And on these wing scales, there are bumps. The tips of the bumps are like magnets for water. The sides of the bumps are waxy. So fog comes in, begins to aggregate on the tips. The water runs down the trough and into the critter's mouth. This is being mimicked now in fog catching nets that are 10 times better than the fog catching nets we currently have. In fact, there's a company that is putting this surface on the inside of water bottles to create a self-filling water bottle. Water is the new oil. It's what nations will be fighting over, unfortunately. Being able to pull water out of air, that's one of the more exciting biomimetic areas. For more episodes of Think Like a Tree, subscribe to the Wired channel. All right, so I, I think that's pretty cool. We are literally, uh, they talk about biomimicry. We're literally mimicking what is already happening in nature. In this case, as she mentioned, water is going to end up being, hopefully, in, or not hopefully, but unfortunately in the next 100 years, um, water is going to end up being just as scarce as oil is right now. Um, and so countries are going to literally have to probably fight. It's already happening. If you, if you know where Yemen is, it's just south of Saudi, America, Saudi Arabia. Um, they are fighting right now over clean water and it's, it's led to a civil war. So this is a big problem. We, we are running out of 
drinkable water. It's hard to imagine because our planet is covered by 70% ocean, but we can't drink the ocean. The ocean is salt water. So um, you need specific technologies to be able to actually um, drink ocean water to get to get rid of the salt first. So it's a big problem. So we're learning from these beetles how we can actually collect water from um, the atmosphere, how we can collect water from fog. It's, it's pretty remarkable. <clears throat> but like I said, these beetles help us to make three useful observations. And this might be a good thing to write down. I didn't highlight it, um, but it sh I think you guys probably should include it in your notes for the day. The first observation that we can make is that organisms are remarkably well suited for their environments. You wouldn't see a beetle like the one we're just talking about living uh, in, the, in the polar tundra where there's plenty of water in the form of snow. You wouldn't see it living in the rainforest where there's plenty of water in the form of precipitation. So organisms are going to be remarkably well suited for their environment. The second observation is that organisms have shared characteristics. And this hints at what's called a unity of life. We'll talk more about that. But we saw, we, we looked at those beetles, 350,000 known species of beetle. They all have three, or they all have three pairs of legs and two pairs of wings and a hard exoskeleton. So these shared characteristics give us a hint that maybe at one point in the distant past, there was one singular type of beetle, but over time it evolved into different species. This is what we mean by unity of life. <clears throat> and then again, when we think about that beetle picture that I had up a few slides ago, we saw just how remarkably diverse beetles truly are. They come in different colors, different shapes, they live in different environments, they have different abilities. So there's a remarkable diversity in life. Freeland, do you have notes? Just, you can write on the back of the sheet that I gave you guys yesterday. I think that's what I see several others doing. It's a good idea. Okay, do you need more time, Ayana? You good, Gloria? All right, <clears throat> so this is where this idea of descent with modification comes in. This is a picture of Charles Darwin late in his life. Uh, he was actually probably most prolific when he was a young man in his 20s and 30s. Um, but he was really the first person to make those three observations that we just talked about. And in doing so, he proposed that Earth's many species are descendants of ancestral species that were different from the present day species. So for example, this beetle that we just talked about, it's a descendant of some beetle that existed a long time ago that was different. It, was, it didn't probably have this ability to collect water from the air, um, but over time, because of this process of what we now call evolution, um, those new abilities did come about. So before Darwin ever used the word evolution, before he used the term natural selection, he called this descent with modification because um, with, with each descent, we're seeing slight changes uh, in a species that might eventually lead to the creation of a new, totally new species. 
Here is an image that kind of shows some of Darwin's travels. He traveled in this boat called the HMS Beagle. Uh, and he literally traveled across the world. So they left Great Britain. They went to the eastern coast of South America and Brazil, and then they traveled around Cape Horn, the southern the southern part of the southern tip of South America. And um, they eventually made a pretty prolonged stop in the Galapagos Islands, and that's where Darwin made many of his most important discoveries. From there, they continued west uh, to New Zealand and Australia. They also made a stop in Indonesia and was called the Malay Archipelago. And then they went to Cape of Good Hope in Southern Africa. So it was this, this took place over the course of, I believe, six years um, traveling by boat around the world. So again, the Galapagos, this is just off the western coast of Ecuador. And it's an archipelago of volcanic islands. So an archipelago is just a collection of islands that are pretty close to one another. Um, and this is where he made some of his most important discoveries and observations. So let's take a look at this video. This living laboratory of evolution helped to inspire Charles Darwin and continues to offer a unique opportunity to explore a pristine natural ecosystem. The Galapagos Islands are located 620 miles or 1,000 kilometers from the South American mainland, but a world apart from anywhere else on Earth. The archipelago and its surrounding waters, located where three ocean currents converge, are famed for the unique animal species found nowhere else on Earth, including marine iguanas, giant tortoises, flightless cormorants, and a diverse variety of finches. The islands have two airports, Isla Baltra and Isla San Cristobal, which are serviced by regular flights from mainland cities Quito and Guayaquil. As water temperatures change and seasons shift, different types of wildlife become more or less plentiful, so it's worth keeping a must-see species list in mind when planning your itinerary. ancestors of these iguanas almost certainly lived in the jungles of Central America. There, still today, you can see iguanas in the trees overhanging the rivers, nibbling leaves, or on rafts of reeds. Just occasionally, are swept out to sea, and the vast majority, of course, die there. But just a few, a long time ago, were fortunate enough to be swept by favorable currents out to the ocean and pitched up here. In their ancestral rainforest habitat, iguanas are vegetarians. Here, they browse on juicy leaves. But the iguanas that first appeared in the Galapagos could find no such things. So these iguanas, to survive, had to eat the only kind of leaf that was available. Seaweed. And to get the best of that, they had to do something even more radical. They had to swim. They even learned to dive. They acquired the ability to hold their breath for up to an hour so that they could swim down to a depth of 20 meters. 
Their claws strengthened so they could cling to the rocks on the seabed. And under the water, they found an endless supply of seaweed, which grew in abundance in the nutrient-rich currents that flow around the islands. was not all. Their snouts became flatter to help them graze. And their teeth became sharper to grip the slippery seaweed. Okay, so what these videos demonstrate is, um, number one, the remarkable diversity of life in the Galapagos. Number two, we hear him using, in the second video, that's David Attenborough, by the way, we hear him using this language of they acquired the ability. It's not necessarily that they learned how to do these things. It just so happened to be that some of them, and we'll talk about this process called natural selection even more, some of them already had that ability. And the ones who did have the ability to hold their breath, to exist underwater, to swim, those are the ones who ended up surviving because they could find food. And of course, when you survive, what do you also end up doing? You do, and, but let's think about what happens when, for example, people reach puberty. What do they have the ability to do? What did you say? Same. Same? Okay, change, yes. But puberty also brings with it what? The ability to, to reproduce. Yes, yes, yes. That's what we want to focus on. When you survive, you can also reproduce. The ancestors of these iguanas almost certainly lived in the jungles of Central America. <laughs> okay, so a little bit more, and then I'll have you guys take some, some notes. There won't be too many notes, but <clears throat> excuse me. So one of Darwin's most important ideas was that organisms share a common ancestor, but they branch off from their ancestor and it ends up creating this tree of life at the point in time at which they separate. So I know this is pretty small for you all um, on the screen right now, but what we should be able to see is, is kind of the evolution of elephants. So if you look at the very bottom of this tree of life, only three species of ele elephants are currently alive. Only three species currently exist today. Um, there are two species of African elephant, and there's also one species of Asian elephant, and we can see the scientific names there as well. All of their ancestors have essentially uh, gone extinct. So, in the last ice age <clears throat> but they have a common ancestor all those other species of elephant have since gone extinct All 
All right, so this is what I want you guys to write down in, in yellow. Sorry if you are not a fan of mice. That's, that's probably pretty disturbing. But <clears throat> one of the key tenets of natural selection is that species have the potential to increase in numbers exponentially. And again, I don't want to just think about things from a human perspective. We could be talking about bacteria, as we see in the image on the left. We could be talking about plant species. Uh, that image in the center is kudzu. Has anybody ever heard of kudzu? We'll talk more about kudzu. Kudzu is an extremely invasive species of, of ivy um, that came from Japan, but is now proliferating throughout the American South. And it's just totally taking over some landscapes and it's killing off other plant species. So it's actually a, it's a big problem. Um, and then of course we could be talking about other animal species as we'll, we see on the right. But species have the potential to increase in numbers exponentially. What, is, what does exponentially mean? A lot, really rapidly, yeah. So we're not talking about one, then two, then three, Two becoming four, four becoming eight, eight becoming 16, 32, 64, and this is happening quickly. But just because they have the potential to do this, the potential to increase in numbers, doesn't mean that it actually happens. In fact, in most cases, they cannot increase exponentially, or at least they don't do so forever, because there is a finite supply of the resources needed for life. There's a limited supply. So in the image on the left, we see um, zebras and would also look like some other species that are you know, trying to get to this really small watering hole somewhere probably on the African continent. So of course, all species need water to survive. We need water for cellular respiration, but there's a limited supply of water. So that limits the, the, the number of individuals within a population. We could think about plants that are on the floor of the rainforest. If you're on the floor of the rainforest, then what are you probably missing out on? If you're a plant on the floor of the rainforest, what are you probably not getting much of? You're not getting a lot of sunlight because there's this very dense canopy above you. So they have to, the plants on the floor of the rainforest have to compete for sunlight. That means that the plants with the biggest leaves tend to do the best. They can capture the most sunlight. So um, if you ever look at pictures of plants on the floor of the, of the forest or on the floor of the rainforest, you notice that they have these really wide leaves. And it, it, the purpose is to capture as much sunlight as possible. Okay, so because of this limited supply of resources, we see that individuals within a population have to compete. But how do populations decide which organisms get to survive and reproduce and which ones die? How do they make that decision? Any thoughts about that? How do they make the decision as to who gets to survive and who dies? It really goes back to that competition I was just talking about. They have to, the ones that can compete the best for the limited resources are going to survive. So it's not an active choice. It's not like they go to the polls and vote and say, all right, this year we're gonna elect these 100 individuals to survive and I'm sorry, everybody else, you're, you're gonna die. It's a matter of who can compete the best. That competition comes from genetic variability. We talked about genes in the last unit. But populations are genetically variable. No two individuals within a population are going to be exactly alike. So we see these ladybugs here. Clearly they have you know, different patterns on their backs. They've got different number of spots and different sizes of spots. So they're all genetically variable. But let's say that something were to happen and, and we said that you know, the individuals that have the least number of spots are going to survive the best. 
then that means that individuals that had 10 spots are going to die that year. And individuals that only have one or two are probably going to do pretty well. So this is how competition comes into play. The genetic difference is already there, just like with the iguanas. There were already some iguanas that had the, the, the genetic ability to hold their breath and to swim. But it wasn't until they actually had to face that reality that those individuals survived and everybody else died. So the genetic variation is already present within the population. As the environment changes, specific phenotypes get selected for. This means that specific phenotypes that give an advantage end up being selected for. So we can think about this example here. Uh, the image on the left is of what's called an okapi. The okapi and the giraffe, uh, the, okapi is, the okapi is basically the, the ancestor of the giraffe. Now you can see that the okapi is really not much bigger than a horse. But over time, as food resources became limited, and it was much more difficult to reach food that was either on the ground or that was hanging pretty low to the ground, the organisms that had the longer necks were being selected for. They had a genetic advantage. They had a specific body type that allowed them to compete for resources better. And so while in this competition, they're surviving more, they're having more offspring. The okapi at its tallest is only about 5.7 feet tall. The giraffe can grow as tall as 18.7 feet tall. Okay? And that allows it to reach food that other organisms simply cannot reach. So this is what it looks like. When the environment changes, individuals are going to have some type of genetic advantage. In this case, the genetic advantage was, was a long neck that gave giraffes access to taller foods, or foods that were higher up, I should say. It, it, the picture is making them look larger than they are, I'm sure. So the organisms that have favorable adaptations survive, they reproduce, and as you reproduce, of course, you're passing on your genes. You've got favorable traits. You end up passing those traits on to your offspring. And, uh, this is what it looks like in humans. So this is just a picture I threw in my, my family, my parents and my, my twin sister. You can see that we basically look alike. <laughs> you, you think so? <laughs> I get that a lot. But yeah, those genes get passed on. And whether it's the genes that make you look the way you are, or if it's the genes that allow you to eat certain foods or that give you a certain muscle composition, they get passed on to your offspring. All right, now this is when we start to get into this topic of evolution. First phrase of this sentence says, over time. Over time. So we're not talking about within one specific generation. We're not talking about two or three generations. Evolution takes place over the course of hundreds, if not thousands of years. But over time, those favored alleles, they start to accumulate throughout the species. 
and this is this is what we call evolution. The alleles that give a certain advantage eventually are going to become more and more common within or throughout the species. So we'll talk more about this, but um, at, at one point, of course, the only place where you would find living organisms was in the sea. But as the conditions on land began to change, um, some plant species were able to survive on land outside of the water. This meant that organisms that were capable of leaving water had access to food if they could do so. If they could leave the water, they had access to foods that other species simply couldn't get to. And so the earliest land dwelling species, the earliest amphibians, um, only came out of the water basically to eat and then they return to the water to do everything else, to mate, to lay their eggs. But over time, we see this evolution um, and it gets to the point where now they don't, they, they can mate under, underwater, but they can lay their eggs on land and that protects the eggs a little bit. There aren't as many predators on land. And over time, those, those eggs learn that they don't need to live in water. Now, again, I use the word learn loosely. It's not a, an active process of learning, it's just the ability to do so. And this is all driven by competition. Why would I compete for food underwater if I'm the only one who can go on land and eat there and I have access to all the food I want? Why would I compete for space to lay my eggs underwater when I could just go on land and lay my eggs there and they won't ever be preyed upon by, by predators? All right, so um, competition is driving this process. Thought I got rid of this slide, sorry. All right, so <clears throat> that first bullet point is what I, what I want you guys to write down. And this is the actual definition of natural selection. The process in which organisms that are better adapted to their environment tend to survive and produce more offspring. Organisms that are better adapted to their environment tend to survive and produce more offspring. Okay. 
to sum it up, the four most important components of natural selection are genetic variation. Now keep in mind, genetic variation is always going to happen. No two individuals within, an indiv within a population or within a species are going to be exactly alike. There's always some amount of genetic variation. Inheritance, so you pass on your genes to your offspring. Competition, because there's, there are limited resources. And then reproduction. Cool. All right, so here's another good example of this process. So um, these are three species of finch, which is a small bird. And all three of these species were found by Charles Darwin, discovered by Charles Darwin on the Galapagos Islands. Um, you see the, again, the scientific names there as well. I'm not really gonna try to get into that. But what makes these birds different? Because they are all finches, they live in the same place, they look pretty similar. What's, what's different about them? Okay, yeah, they're, they're, there is a difference in their feathers. And maybe that's like different in the round. I think they're different. They're both, they're both, they're both. But the feathers might be a camouflage, you know, of some sort. What else do you notice that's different about them? Okay, let's stick, let's stick with that. What, the beak, the beak is different. All of them have different beaks. Thank you, Monet, yeah. What are those, what's that difference about? Why do they have different beaks? Why would they have different beaks? Think about competition again. That's a key component of natural selection. What are they competing for? For food, yeah, yeah. So they developed, they evolved to have different beaks because this gave them access to different types of food. This very first bird on the, on the top left, oh, okay, yeah, they have different beaks. This gives them access to different food. So this very first bird in the top left is a cactus eater. So it's got that sharp, hard beak that allows it to, it gives it protection um, near the cactus, but it also allows it to penetrate the cactus and extract nutrients. The one in the middle there is a seed eating bird. So it's got that really wide, um, also similarly hard beak that allows it to crack seeds open on the ground. Again, and you can actually look and see that its wings appear to be a little bit smaller than the other birds because it lives on the ground for the most part. That's where it eats. And then uh, the bird in the top right is an insect eating bird. So it's got that long, sharp beak that can um, basically stab insects, especially insects that are kind of hiding away and within the bark of trees. All right, so these beaks gave them access to different types of food. Um, and this is a great example of, of natural selection. All right, so let's do this practice problem. As most individuals of a certain species of bird have medium length tails, but tail length ranges within the species from very short to very long. If a new predator arrived that preferred to prey on birds with medium length tails, which graph describes the most likely result? So the graph has tail length on the x-axis and it has number of birds on the y-axis. Um, 
what's going to happen if a new predator arrives that prefers to prey on birds with medium length tails? What, what will happen? Now, keep in mind that this population of birds, they have some that have short tails, some that have long tails, but it says most of them uh, have medium link tails, but this new predator likes those medium link tails. So what's gonna happen? Yeah, the birds with the medium link tails get eaten. And so within the larger population, what's gonna, ha what's gonna start to happen to the, to the bird, the tail length? What'd you say? It can grow. Thank you, Rudy. Yeah. Um, it could either grow or it's going to get really short, right? So birds that have short tails, they survive. And the birds that have the, the long tails, they survive. So which graph kind of looks like that? And the, the ones with the medium length tails, they, they do not survive. Which graph depicts that the best? Yeah, I think I heard somebody say it. A, right? So, most likely. All right. Okay. So a little bit longer, nothing to write down though. Um, what do you all know about the industrial revolution? Anybody know anything about it? Nothing about the industrial revolution. Okay. You guys will learn more about this in the activity, but uh, I, the industrial revolution took place in uh, primarily in Western Europe and in the United States in the 19th century, so like in the late 1800s. And during this time, huge factories were being built. This was a period of mass production. Um, urban areas were growing rapidly, so people moved from the farms that they used to live and work on into city places where they could work in factories and warehouses. Uh, in the process of doing so, a lot of natural gas was being burned. A lot of coal was being burned. Um, and that released a lot of pollutants into the atmosphere. Uh, and not just pollutants that you couldn't see, but you could literally see the sky would be black as there would be dark smoke and soot that would be coming out of these huge chimneys. Um, and it would cover the landscape. So, you know, people would be walking home and their clothes would become black with soot. The houses were covered in, in black soot. Um, and then of course the surrounding forest areas, the trees were also getting darker because of this soot as well. So the trees that had once been light in color got progressively darker. So what do you notice here in this image? Okay, yeah, these are actually moths. Um, Okay, so you can't see that they're here, right? But this one is much better camouflaged. But you can even you can see this one instantly. It's kind of like a heat force um, a little bit. So as the trees get darker, which color moth has the better camouflage? The darker, the black moth, yeah. But it used to be the case that the trees before the, revo before the Industrial Revolution were all white. So if the trees were white, then which colored moth had the advantage? The white moths, yeah. <clears throat> so we start to, we, we could literally see in the course of, you know, uh, about a hundred years or so, we saw the color of the moth populations change due to changes in their environments. So before the industrial revolution, they looked like that. Afterwards, they looked more like that. Now in this case, they're not competing for food. They're, they're basically competing for safety, 
right? They want to be camouflaged. They don't want to be as easily spotted by whatever birds they, you know, they were probably being eaten by. So they're competing for safety in this case, and it's driving their, their evolution. So we can see before the Industrial Revolution, um, of course, there were some dark moths, there were some, some light moths, but as the trees got darker, we start to see more and more dark colored moths. You guys are going to explore this in the activity for the day. Um, I know we only have 10 minutes. So actually the only thing we're gonna focus on right now is So for my folks at home, if you all can just go ahead and open up Canvas, that would be great. The assignment that I want you to look at is called U8D2 Natural Selection Gizmo. Yeah. All right. So, yes, the class code is WFWFFR. And then make sure that you, have, make sure you write down your username and your password. So the student exploration basically walks you through the ecosystem and it's and it's
So the student exploration sheet I did put in Canvas as well, but you can also find it in the gizmo once you're there. So at the top, there's a drop down that says lesson info. You can find the student exploration sheet there as well. You can open it up as a Google Doc. That's probably the best way to do it. And I will do that. It will force you to make a copy. As always, you should make sure you save it to your biology folder. <clears throat> so if you follow the student exploration sheet, it'll tell you exactly what you need to do. Um, in the beginning, it's going to ask you some, some prior knowledge questions that you need to do before you use the gizmo. Let me share this tab. So there's some prior knowledge questions that you do before using the gizmo. And then once you start to scroll down and you make your way through the sheet, it's going to give you directions about what to do. So for example, in this very first question here, it says, check that light trees is selected and then click play and hunt moths for a year. So let's see. Light trees. Light trees are selected. We're going to click play. Hopefully your internet is not as slow as mine. So we're just going to hunt moths for a year. Oh, I guess I was supposed to actually, okay. So you actually have to hunt. My bad. So. I didn't see any more. Oh, I saw was two. How many did you guys get? Okay. All right, so you all get the gist. Um, of course, tomorrow is virtual, so we're just going to have like 10, I'll talk for 10 minutes, and then we'll take time to do this tomorrow. <laughs> Have a good day. Thank you, Adrian.
See you, Ayana. See you, Alex. I wasn't getting all that many. Total? 